Well, hello everyone and welcome to this live AMA with Shopify, GitLab and Fellow. I'm super excited that you're joining us today. Thank you to everyone here and a special thank you to Mark and Darren for being here today and uh, offering their time to answer questions from our community about remote work and remote leadership. So thank you so much for being here today. We're very excited for this conversation. So why don't we, we go ahead and start with some introductions. I know Darren, we're very interested to learn about your Guinness World Record. <laughs> so maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your role as GitLab's head of remote, as well as your Guinness World Record, please. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks all for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate you being gracious with your time. So as Manuela said, I'm Darren. I'm the head of remote at GitLab. I've worked across the spectrum of remote for over 15 years now. And during a pocket of that, I actually worked remotely as the managing editor of a tech publication called Engadget, where I earned a Guinness World Record as the world's most prolific professional blogger. And so that goes to show that remote work is not only possible, but it actually helped enable me to earn a Guinness World Record uh, while I actually went to all 50 US states and I think over 30 or 35 countries. So I, uh, I wrote a book about that. It's called Living the Remote, Remote Dream, if you wanna dive in further. Uh, and that has taken me all the way to today. At GitLab, we are the world's largest all remote company. We have over 1300 employees in over 65 countries with no company owned offices. Uh, and there's a big difference between all remote and other forms of remote. I've learned a lot over the years and hope to share that with the crowd today. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to ask you more about that difference between all remote and other types of remote. So I'm gonna make sure to ask about that later on. But before that, I would love to introduce you to our second panelist. Mark is the head of revenue at Shopify Plus, and we're super honored to have you here today, Mark, because I know you have a lot of leadership experience and you recently transitioned to remote work. So I know we're going to learn a lot about your, your experience. So can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role as Shopify Plus as head of revenue? Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here this afternoon. So Mark Bergen, um, I've been with Shopify Plus uh, about four and a half years now, um, and my role is head of revenue. So I have the sales and the partnership functions. Um, which report in, which have a global dimension to it. So teams in Australia, North America, and uh, Europe. Uh, and I, unlike Darren, have been very much an office-bound, office-centered worker for about 20 years of my career. Uh, and so Shopify moving into what we refer to as digital by default um, is very new for me, and we're learning a lot. And I'll explain a little bit of, of Shopify's background in it. It's not new for Shopify, but it's new for a lot of us and it's new for me and it's new for how to operate sales teams and revenue teams in a remote environment. Um, I've been in technology most of my career and primarily in, in kind of the Canadian market space working with various startups and um, technology businesses. That's awesome and super interesting. And you know, you mentioned it. the reason why I think this AMA is so interesting is because GitLab has uh, historically been an all remote company, right? And on the other hand, Shopify just transitioned to remote work. So I think we're gonna get two very interesting and different perspectives today. Um, so before we begin, I also wanted to let our audience know that Erin Blasky, who is our Director of Marketing at Fellow, will be moderating the Q&A section. So if you have any questions for Mark or Darren, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box and we'll be answering them at the last part of the call. So are we ready for some questions? Let's begin. Um, so I wanted to start with the basics. Uh, I know both GitLab and Shopify have very specific terms to describe their remote cultures. So Darren, you mentioned that GitLab uses the term all remote. And Mark, you mentioned the term digital by, di digital by default. Um, can you both explain a little bit like about, you know, what these terms mean and why your companies chose this very specific terminology to describe the remote culture? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you'll find that uh, pretty much anything I say today is hopefully documented in the GitLab mm -hmm. handbook. We're a very transparent company and we open source all of our knowledge and that includes terminology. So if you actually Google GitLab remote terminology, you'll find an entire page that I wrote on this very topic. All remote is very specific. We have no company owned offices, which means that we have one playing field. So everyone that joins the, com the company is on the same playing field. Remote first, there's generally some sort of physical presence. Even if it's one company headquarters or an employee experience center, there is some place that the company owns where some amount of people can go and work. And in that instance, you're tasked with operating remote first. You assume that everyone will be remote because you don't know if anyone on any given day will be in the office. But you do have to think about that, that there will be some people that are in a different environment. Um, 
both are amazing. There's just some subtle differences on the, the ownership and the physical location piece. And Darren, has GitLab always been an all remote company? We have. So the first three employees were in three different countries. And so they were remote by default. Uh, the founding team actually came to California for Y Combinator and coming out of that, they did get an office briefly. It lasted about three days before people stopped showing up. They didn't want to deal with the commute. Work kept getting done. And they realized very early on that money was much better spent on people, tools, and technology than an office building that they didn't own. And so from the very beginning, we were all remote. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have Shopify. Mark, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about what digital by default means? Yeah, and, and for some backdrop, Shopify is a global business. We're over 5,000 employees. And from the very early days, we've had a support infrastructure of what we refer to as our gurus who support our merchants around the world. Um, that uh, organization is an enormous organization. It's about 40, 30, 40% of our employees, so about 2,000 people who have always been remote and they operate remote. Um, and so for many of us who have been office centered, it's now us learning how to operate like them. So we've operated as a very dynamic company where we have you know 2,000 employees who have always worked remote. That is their world. We've had three or you know 4,000 employees who have been office centric and yet um, bound by this really common culture, depending on what the, you know, no matter what the work environment has been in and what your experience is. Um, for us, as we, you know, as COVID hit, um, our CEO, Toby, you know, basically his view has been the for, you know, the future just pulled forward by five or 10 years. And we see that in our business and e-commerce, certainly, um, but also just the belief of office centricity, that office centricity and this idea that we all need to congregate in physical space, we need to live close to our physical space, and that that becomes um, you know, the common currency around which work gets done is just gone and it's dead and it will be. And so he's making the bet and basically calling it and saying, I don't believe it's going to happen anymore. And in fact, I believe given what we've seen out of our support organization, we can build an organization which probably fits more with how Darren described digital first. So we do have some Shopify, we're calling them now facilities as we think about what we're going to do with them. Um, and it's new for us. There may be some roles that at times we feel need to congregate. Um, we also have people who signed into Shopify with the expectation of physical space. And so, you know, we need to be sensitive to, does everybody have actually a safe space? Is it psychologically safe, physically safe? Um, so there's considerations like that we're working through as we go, but our intent is the vast majority of people and the vast majority of work will be remote. And that is our assumption moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I assume that as you transition to remote work, you've had to adopt many practices, right? And many new processes. So I want to ask you a little bit more about that and maybe starting with Darren. Darren, you talked about the importance of documentation, right? You said, hopefully this is documented already, everything I'm saying, uh, because I know documentation has been at the core of GitLab's culture from the very beginning. And I know you have a very, um, you, call, you call this uh, hand, handbook first approach, right? You have like a very defined term for this. So I wanted to ask you about that. Like what are some of the processes that you implemented from the very beginning and you would recommend any other company who is transitioning to remote work to implement? Yeah, so if you Google GitLab handbook first, you'll see a guide on what this means and it's open source companies can uh, literally copy it word for word and implement it. Documentation is a dangerous term because if you just allow people to document, that means something different to everyone. So your finance team may be documenting in one place and your HR team in another place and then you get communication silos. We say handbook first to remind people that we have a single source of truth, which is the GitLab company handbook. And we actually use GitLab, the product, to build that handbook and iterate on that. There's hundreds of improvements on that every single day. And we use the version control feature of that so that anyone can make a proposal, even outside of GitLab. We have a lot of the broader community that will make suggestions for improving our handbook. And we do this because as a remote team, you can't be sure that anyone is available or online at any given time. It helps reinforce our bias for asynchronous, which we fundamentally believe is a more inclusive way to work. We try to reduce the reliance on synchronicity to get work done. And that means we have to document things as we go so that other people around the company will have access to the most up-to-date information. And it's really key in onboarding that we train people to look first in the handbook and to adopt this practice of self-service and self-learning, which is very counterintuitive if you're used to tapping someone on the shoulder to fill in any knowledge gaps that you have. And it actually can feel kind of isolating and jarring initially. Uh, and people very much opt into this culture. We're very upfront about what it's gonna be like, and you're gonna have to write a lot. 
when you get here, but you learn that this creates massive efficiencies. The more that's written down, the less you have to re-answer. We have this concept called answer with a link. And so just as you're asking me these questions, my goal is to be able to answer with a link. For anything that I'm saying, I hope that there's a link that will add additional context. And so if we get asked a question at GitLab and the problem actually hasn't been solved and hasn't been documented, we take the approach of finding the answer, finding the subject matter expert, then documenting it, putting it in the handbook so that if anyone has this question henceforth, they'll be able to find it in the handbook. That's super interesting. And it's a great approach for anyone new joining the company, right? They have that one single source of truth for everything related to the company. So that's super cool. Mark, has your team always documented all their processes or is this something you started doing now that you're working remotely? Um, we probably fall in the middle. Um, Shopify is a fairly um, documentation heavy company, um, although documentation can take many forms. And so certainly we have an internal repository we refer to as the vault. We have lots of information. There's lots of information being documented right now on digital by default. What does that mean? You know, we're still sorting out a lot of things. There's a lot of questions that we've taken on as we've gone through this. And so we are being transparent about the way we think about it with our people. Um, we're trying to be very transparent in our decisions and trying to create, you know, as Darren said, kind of one single source of truth that people can go to to understand. I think what I'm finding as kind of a revenue leader within the business is, which is a new one, is while a lot of our major decisions get documented in our thinking and planning and those pieces, there's a lot of day-to-day -day pieces that when you're in a physical location, you get super used to just, you know, the over the monitor conversation or grabbing someone in the hallway, the lunch line, even Slack to a degree where quick decisions are made, they disappear depending on how you've set Slack up in 90 days or, you know, 180 days. And so there is, I think, some learnings that we're starting to recognize that some of the things we've taken for granted till now is being institutionalized knowledge or if we make a decision, everybody heard and everybody's aware, they're not anymore. It might be between two people on Slack or two people over Hangout um, or a Zoom link, and it's now time to actually get more serious about how we document. So we're doing that certainly with our projects and how we think about um, major initiatives we have underway. But it is, I'm starting to realize, and I won't say I'm good at it yet, but I'm starting to realize the importance of it for a lot of decisions I've taken for granted up until now. That's, that's interesting. And um, I was going to ask Darren, like, Darren, you have a lot of experience with this. Do you have any tips or best practices for teams that just like Mark's team are just getting started or, or you know, implementing this documentation processes? Yeah. So the challenges that were verbalized there are very real. Um, and we do a couple of things to try to um, address those at GitLab. We have transparency as one of our core values. And we actually have a key performance indicator where we quarter over quarter, try to make sure that the percentage of Slack messages sent as private or direct messages actually goes down and the ratio of the public messages sent go up. And that helps more decisions be made in public so that they're broadcast to the broadest amount of people, which goes along with our mission of everyone can contribute. We want as many eyes on things as possible so that if people even outside of the organization have feedback or have an idea or they've heard something from one of their other client consultations, they're able to pour in. Now this only works because a few of our other sub values like no ego and blameless problem solving, short toes. I love short toes. It means everyone at GitLab has short toes so it's impossible to step on anyone's proverbial toes. You have to have some of these cultural underpinnings in place to empower people to be that transparent and show their work even if it's in draft. And we believe that everything is under construction and we have no issues at all shipping something that is just a minimum viable product, just a better iteration. You really have to adopt all of these things for this to feel really succinct. Otherwise, to Mark's point, you're kind of, you're missing out on some of those hallway conversations where decisions get done very quickly, but in private. And so in a remote setting, you just have to get a lot more comfortable with decisions being made in public and, uh, and, and operating with no ego. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. yeah, sorry, Mark, please continue. I was going to say actually two, two comments on that, I, that, that I think really hit on. Darren mentioned kind of the concept of trust. We talk a ton about trust and we use this concept of a trust battery internally in Shopify. Um, and one of the things that, that we've talked about internally a little bit and kind of recognize that I'm really starting to notice now in a remote environment is if you want to be transparent, it means also you're going to see some of the messy stuff along the way. It's not buttoned up. We don't have all the answers. We're learning as we go. We're making decisions as we go. But here's how we're thinking about it. And here's the process we're going through. And we 
expect a, a fairly high degree of trust with one another that you'll accept that, you know, you're seeing how the sausage is made. It's not done yet. Um, and that's been really important for us. And I think one of the things that um, we continue to focus a lot as a, on as a company, um, and I would encourage others who are thinking about or considering what this world looks like, it, it's really strongly independent in trust, as Darren mentioned. The other thing, actually, don't, uh, I realize this is not intended to be a, um, uh, about fellow, but actually, we've adopted fellow quite heavily internally, and it's a fantastic tool for us for just rapid documentation in one place around meetings we're having, group meetings, um, forwarding, or, or, or having kind of common agenda items that are kind of continuing to roll forward for meetings. And so we've started to adopt some tools like that that we have found to be really helpful in capturing documentation in one place and um, something you can always refer back to in, in written format. That's awesome. Thanks for giving us a shout out. <laughs> um, I was actually going to ask you about tools because uh, I know uh, as, as more teams go remote, they're, you know, adopting new productivity tools uh, and tools to help them stay communicated and connected. Uh, are there any other tools? I know you mentioned Slack, you mentioned GitLab, you mentioned Fellow. Are there any other tools that have helped you stay productive and connected while working remotely? Both of you. You want to take that one, Mark? Uh, I actually am interested in your answer because we're still learning it. I'd say that uh, the, the, you know, so number one, we're still learning it. We've always been with, you know, a, a large portion of our um, business, which is remote to begin with. We've always been very comfortable and really adopted the use of video conferencing technologies. As I mentioned, we do a lot of documentation internally with project management, um, uh, you know, systems set up and frameworks that are used holistically across the business to create a high level of transparency. Um, we're still learning though. And I think what's been interesting and Darren and I have talked a little bit about this briefly was, you know, the world, the tools today are not built for remote work. The tools today are built for office workers sitting behind a desk, working with other people. And so one of the comments that Toby made our CEO when we were first heading into this and he was kind of talking about digital by default and just calling out the direction we were going to go was, you know, we are seeing the worst version we can possibly see right now. And the tools are only going to get better from this point forward. So we are, you know, always playing with tools and learning and practicing with different calendar management and documentation and similar. But I also feel right now that the tool set out there was never really designed for this or the tools that were designed for this environment are pretty thin. Yeah, at GitLab, we use GitLab, the product, for all of our collaboration across the entire company, well beyond engineering. Our entire company uses it to collaborate asynchronously on tools. And minimizing your tool stack and trying to focus work communication into a single place is really big for remote teams. And to Mark's point, uh, most companies that have been thrust into remote are in what I call phase one of remote adaptation, which is essentially skeuomorphism. You're attempting to press copy on the office environment and paste it into a virtual environment. So if you had a certain recurring meeting that happened in a boardroom, you still have that meeting, but instead of it happening in a boardroom, it happens in Zoom. You don't change who attends, you don't change the time, you don't change your meeting hygiene, you just try to do it exactly the same way. And I get that, for business continuity, that makes sense. But you'll really start unlocking the power of remote when you start questioning, is this meeting really necessary? Is there a tool that actually could replace this meeting and get to the outcome without interrupting the day of however many people are in this meeting? And for, for GitLab, we have a, a pretty minimal tool stack. We do all of our work in GitLab. We do use Zoom for video communications. We use G Suite for temporal documentation uh, and we use Slack, but we mostly use Slack for informal communication. We expire all of our messages after 90 days to force people to just use it informally because you don't want to do work in a place where you'll have no history or remembrance of it in 90 days. And so instead we fill it with topical channels, things like hiking and travel and parenting where people can just be humans and converse together. Sort of the, the virtual lobby that you miss out on uh, in an all remote setting. But we, we do use a few tools that are specific to organizations like Salesforce, for example, and marketing operations, but we try to keep it as minimal as we possibly can. And one thing that uh, I've seen pop up, I think this will happen a lot more. There are tools that are being developed to bridge a lot of the gaps that we're now seeing. And one of the questions I get often is, how do I build rapport with someone potentially that I've never met or worked with before? And there's a cool uh, company called Psych Insights and there's a tool called Kona that actually plugs into your chat tool and it works on insights for each individual person 
And it's really amazing to give you this snapshot view of, hey, this is a teammate you've never worked before. This is how they prefer to be communicated with. Uh, this, they're red, yellow, or green today. These kinds of things that you might be able to get a sense of in the office just by the context clues that you kind of miss out on in remote. There are some tools that are emerging to, to bridge that gap. That's really cool. And I love, Darren, that you mentioned the uh, human aspect, right? Like you need channels to like talk about things outside of work. So I would love to transition a little bit to that topic. Like how do you create this human connection with people who are not necessarily in the same city or even country as you? Yeah, uh, at GitLab, we mostly use Slack for informal communication. We fill our Slack with topical channels, and we also have location channels. So whenever we get five or six people in a geographic region, whether it's the Bay Area or Singapore or London, we'll create a location channel. And so regardless of someone's function, if they're relatively close to someone, they can join that location channel. And when travel is freer, we see a lot of these people actually make ad hoc co-working days where they will get 20 or 30 people together that just so happen to live together and or live near each other and, and work together. We also have a visiting grant where we will partially subsidize travel to encourage people to travel around the world and, and meet other GitLab team members. We're really intentional about in-person interactions. Uh, we get the whole company together once a year for essentially a week of team excursions and team bonding. We try to get as many people as possible in person for our GitLab commit user events and for sales conferences throughout the year. So even though we're an all remote company, it doesn't mean we don't see each other. We actually love to see each other at GitLab. We look forward to business trips because it means we get to see people. And I think for a lot of people in co-located companies, they'll do anything they can to get out of a business trip. And it's actually quite the opposite for us because it's a pretty special, special occasion to get to see someone in person. That's an interesting, um, Comment. One of the things I personally have noticed as we've gone through this is my identity as it related to Shopify has been really attached to a physical presence. I went to a particular office. It had a certain word on it. I sat with people. And so my identity was very much around that office space, but also happened to be the product line within Shopify I worked for. And what I've noticed now in a digital by default world is I'm not centered on an office anymore. And to some degree, while I still resonate really highly with my product line, it's far more actually about my geography. And I was talking to um, a guy by the name of John Reardon who runs our um, European support team. Um, and he's got a ton of experience with remote work. Uh, and I was talking to him about some tips and tricks that he's learned as he's gone through it. And what they found, what they were doing in Ireland, and, and much like you said, Darren, I mean, you know, us coming together, there's kind of the ritual of it. People really look forward to it. There are always celebrations. They're the chance to meet other people and bond and, and enjoy one another. Uh, but what he found was, and one of the things he was doing in Ireland was, he would just find a hotel that, you know, just so like, what is the single worst day for booking out your conference room? And it'd be like, you know, well, Wednesdays are terrible because I have a Monday, Tuesday. He'd say, great, what are you going to charge me? And he would just book it and invite anybody from, frankly, anybody who wanted to travel in just to come and work. And he would have people from all kinds of different divisions of the business coming together. And what they found is it just become this cadence. It would be on any given random day, given city at a different hotel, and they would run it every week or two weeks. Um, but it created a way that it allowed people to come together to create some human bonding in the middle of it. But it broke down also a lot of barriers across the business and created way more collaboration and sense of identity, which I thought was really interesting. And I look forward to trialing some things like that, too. Yeah, I actually love that Mark touched on identity. I think this is a really crucial piece that we should underline here. For a long time, especially in North America, our, our identity as a human has been way tightly tied to our vocation and not just our vocation, but four walls and a roof, the actual building that you commute to every day. So suddenly you have tens of millions of people that don't do that. And they're kind of questioning, well, who am I without that daily commute? And I think it's actually a benefit that this is allowing us to pause and really question how healthy was that ratio. And we're realizing that to some degree, it's not the workplace's responsibility to fill 100% of a worker's social quota. So at GitLab, we actually encourage people to get out of work as fast as you can and engage with your family, engage with your local community, and then share those stories back through Slack. I'm able to see this continual photo roll of people in 65 countries doing amazing things at places that matter to them. For me, that emboldens and builds relationships in a way that could never be replicated by a virtual happy hour or a talent show or trivia. Not to say those things aren't valuable, but encouraging people to be where they are and have their identity more focused on wherever they're at, it's a, it's a paradigm shift for companies that um, 
really value the in-office culture and take some degree of pride in how much people are invested in their company. But what we've seen is that the more you allow people to be invested in where they're at, the more they pour into the company as a, as a sense of thanks. I'll, I'll build on that real quick here and you reminded me of something. One of the things I found fascinating about Shopify and I really respect is they care a lot about you being the authentic you. Whoever you are, we hired you. We didn't hire you to conform to who we are or who we think you should be or who you think you should be in an office environment. We hired you. So bring all of you to work. And I think actually, I think you hit on this, Darren, which is an interesting point. In moving to digital by default, we're actually freeing people up in a way to actually be even more of who they are, to spend time not sitting in a car for an hour a day commuting, to actually get more involved in the things they care about, the passion projects, to actually be more holistically who they are. And I think that's a really interesting observation. Yeah, and it's really interesting to see, you know, where your coworkers live, maybe like even their kids, you know, I feel like we're getting to know more of our coworkers now that everyone's working from home, for sure. Yeah, you'll hear my daughter's piano in the background shortly, <laughs> I'd be happy to introduce you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I love that we, we transition into this topic of work-life balance and, and being yourself, right? Showing up as yourself at work, uh, because one of our, um, someone in our audience asked this question about redefining the boundaries when it comes to work-life balance. So as leaders, how are you really finding those boundaries now that you're working remotely, Mark, for example, and Darren, how do you promote that work-life balance on your team? Darren, do you wanna take this as a start? Kind of touches on something Darren and I were talking about the other day. Yeah, it. absolutely. So it's an interesting question because it's exacerbated by the situation that we're in. So right now, globally, there is no what I call buffer time for anyone doing anything. On a week pre-COVID where I would fly to a work site, for example, well, I spend an hour packing, an hour or two driving to the airport, an hour or two just getting through security and getting settled. Well, that's already a handful of hours in my week that I cannot do anything productive. I can't do any work. But if you delete that time from tens of millions of people at once, well, now there's really no excuse to not maximize productivity in every single minute other than people are just drawing the line for themselves. No one's going out to eat. Even you groceries are being delivered, fundamentally everything has changed. So we weren't really prepared for people to have that much time and we're seeing a lot of people actually spend more time working as a form of escapism. At GitLab, one of our sub values is family and friends first, work second, and we're working hard as leaders to reiterate, reinforce, and remind people to do this. We actually spun up a family and friends first day. We've done this on a few Fridays where we shut down the entire company. We also have a Slack channel where we encourage people to post photos and videos and stories of what they're doing on that day to remind people, hey, do something that's not staring at your laptop or a Zoom camera. And it's a small step. We believe in iteration and we're trying to do better about that. But we've actually seen productivity go up during the pandemic, which is not the desired outcome. We want to make sure people are taking care of their well-being, but it's a thorny subject. It's really tough because driven professionals want to do great work. Uh, and when you consider the global pandemic and the global economy, there's a lot of forces at work and each person is adapting to it a little bit differently. Uh, so I would say if you're a leader, make sure you lean in and encourage this, but also lead by example. A few weeks ago, uh, our CEO took a week off and went almost nowhere because where's he going to go? But it was really beneficial to see him truly checked out. Like meetings were truly pushed out. Decisions were truly pushed out. This is a reminder that even if you're just pausing, reading, meditating, calling your parents, something other than work is really useful to make sure you don't burn out. Yeah, we've seen um, very similar and actually um, a few weeks ago instituted that through the summer now, we expect our people to take Fridays off. We just said, we leadership um, in the business basically recognize that, you know, we've been through a very, very intense period over the last, you know, 10 to 12 weeks, unprecedented change, certainly in our timeline, our time life, sorry. And, you know, to your point, Darren, a lot of people using work as a form of escapism, because what else am I going to do? Um, and people not taking vacations. And so... I, would, I completely agree with you. Number one, from a leadership perspective, lead by example. Take time, you know, take an afternoon and go golfing and do it unselfishly and tell people what you're doing and encourage them to do the same. And at a corporate level, we've actually announced that, you know, for the rest of the summer, um, starting in early June, it was just we're going to four-day work weeks. Everybody gets Friday off. And it was, wasn't a huge, big plan. Everybody cram all your work into. It was like, no, prioritize what you need to do and some stuff's going to push as a result and we accept that. But you need time for R&R. &R. Um, and we all need, for those of us who are very new to this, we need to learn that new balance. 
Yeah, I think leading by example is so important. And I like something that you said, Mark, about telling people that you're doing it, right? It's so important to let people know that you're taking time off so they feel that, like they can also take some time off. We have a question from Julia in the audience. She asked, I'd love to know what your typical day looks like working from home. I think it's related to what we're talking about because she's struggling with finding a routine that works for her. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, it's a great question and I'm, I've been trying to figure it out and I live a very fortunate life, but I, I was talking to a colleague as we were going in through this and he made a fascinating, he just encapsulated it really well. He said, you know, I've spent the last 18 years of my work career perfecting what my day looks like. Get up a certain time, I have breakfast, I go to the gym, I commute, I work, you know, and at the end of work, here's the routine, you know, to kind of go back until I end up going to bed and we repeat the cycle. And he says, 18 years I've spent perfecting it. And now it's all at the window. I don't have to reimagine and invent what it looks like. And Darren made a comment at the office. The challenge or the default typically is, well, I take whatever I did here and I now have to replicate it here. And I've been attempting to actually say, no, this is the way this world looked like. What does this world look like? And so I'm still learning. But for me, like I found I need to get up. I'm up before most of the family in the morning and I do not want to start work. I need to get out and exercise. So this morning I went and golf nine holes and, you know, got an hour and a half outside for a walk. And then, you know, I can start my day kind of at eight o'clock, run till five or five 30 ending has been really difficult for me trying to draw a line and say, now I'm walking away from this and I'm going to, and for me, I found I have to actually physically leave the house for 20 minutes at the end of the day to decompress and chill out and become dad again and not the jerk from the office. Um, and so I'm still learning those things, but that's what I have found. I found something in the morning gets me out of the house has been really important. And at the end of day, physically leaving for a short period of time helps mentally break that. Oh, the other one a lot is a dedicated physical space. And so having dedicated space in the house, that when I leave it, I can close the door and be like, no, that's the workspace. I'm now out of the workspace. I really appreciate the candor and transparency. A lot of that resonates. Um, for the audience, I would encourage you to Google GitLab nonlinear workday. I actually wrote a page on this in our handbook and it's a full chapter in the book that I wrote. And I'll talk on, about that in just a minute. But for, for those who have just been thrust into this, where I would start is if you're used to having a commute, you don't have that anymore. Book something in your calendar in the block that used to occupy your morning commute and your evening commute and deliberately do something with it, whether that's exercise, meditating, praying, calling your parents, cooking, cleaning, doing nothing. You can just choose to do nothing and rest. Rest is amazing. Uh, rest ethic is just as important as a work ethic, but do something with it. It will remind you and make sure a reminder goes off because if not, it's way too easy for the lines between work and life to blur. Um, it, it kind of feels like, am I working from home or do I just live at work? And you want to make sure you don't blur into that live at work uh, type of arrangement. Mark made another important point, which is getting off of work is difficult because there's always one more email. There's always one more Slack. There's always an excuse to hang around longer. And if you end work and then 15 seconds later engage with family, long-term, that's probably not ideal. It is very useful to just plan a walk around the house or a walk around your office or something to just get your mind in a different state because the context switching between those two is intense and immense and it's worth acknowledging and recognizing. Now, one of the things at GitLab that we do that I love is that we have a bias towards asynchronous, which enables a nonlinear or non-contiguous workday. I thrive on this. This morning, for example, I started my day very late in the time zone that I'm in, but my son was up early. Uh, he, he has great mornings, so I was able to enjoy the daylight hours, have breakfast with him, go for a walk, do some things that I wouldn't be able to do at night after he's asleep. And then I intentionally start my day much later than what would be typically expected in the Eastern time zone. And I will work a little bit later because what am I going to do in the evening? My son's asleep. It, this is my peak productivity time. I have great focus time. But I'm also not afraid to break that up. Uh, this is amazing for living an off-peak life. One day when we can go to baseball games again, for example, it's much cheaper and easier to go to a baseball game at 12.30 on a Wednesday than it is prime time on a Saturday. And if you're able to live this nonlinear life, you can say, I'm going to break up my week and go to a baseball game. And then I'm going to come home and I'm going to resume working. This allows you to integrate work into your life instead of life getting the scraps left over from work. If you can implement this, it is game changing and life changing, but it will require some amount of cultural and organizational buy-in. You can't be the only person on your team not adhering to certain hours. It's gonna require 
a collective understanding that this is where we want to go. For many companies, this is way down the road. You're just trying to maintain business continuity. But I wanted to say this to give you a peek into what remote can look like if you stick with it and get really good at it. Have you, um, one of the things I've, I've noticed a little bit of and certainly heard about is more people uh, looking at pets now because they're now home, they're on the house and it actually gives them a reason to get out in the morning or get out in the evening. And so I've got, I mentioned my colleague, John, who will mention things like, you know, think about getting a dog. If you've thought about it, this is a perfect opportunity to do it. It forces exercise. It gets your mind out of work and actually helps force kind of beginning and ending the things. Have you seen that Darren at GitLab? Yeah, absolutely. We have so many pet owners and look, there's a ton of pets that need adopted. It's a great point. Pets are amazing companions. Pets only know how to love. They are amazing creatures. You can learn a lot from them. And yeah, now that you're home and you won't have to board them all day, it's a great reminder to get outside, sort of a natural forcing function to not sit at your desk all day. And also when you look at a smiling cat or dog, it's really hard to have a bad day when you look at that. So it definitely is a morale booster. And if you've ever longed to, I wish every day was bring my pet to work day. Well, now it is. So you can definitely take advantage of that. That's great. I love the idea of replacing your commute with a walk at the park with your new pet. <laughs> yes. um, there's sure. one topic that I wanted to ask you about before we move on into the Q&A section, because we have lots of questions from the audience. And it's this topic that you mentioned earlier of trust and communication, like building trust with your team, building trust with your direct reports. I know this is something you mentioned in the remote handbook or yeah, in the remote, remote handbook, Darren. So I would love to hear from both of you uh, on this topic of building trust with the people that work with you, specifically your direct reports. How do you do that now that you're working remotely? Do you have frequent check-ins? I know one-on-one -on -one meetings are an important part of the Shopify culture. Are they also important at GitLab? I would love to hear from both of your perspectives on this. Yeah, we definitely have one-on-ones. Um, we have a pretty standard agenda. We want all of our managers to roughly use the same agenda so it's not jarring if people transition from one team to another. We kind of look at this from a push versus pull mentality. If you think about a smartphone that you've enabled push notifications for your email, well, every time you get an email, you're, you're notified of it. Well, over time, that becomes really exhausting. You've enabled push and it just hits you even when you may not want that. But if you check in a lot, which is often recommended in a remote setting, that's kind of what it feels like. And I get that people's natural inclination, if you can't see someone in the same room, is to just check in more. But ask yourself, would I be okay with just a barrage of push notifications? Because essentially, you'd be acting as a human push notification. Not everybody is going to be amenable to that. So we tend to err towards the pull side of that equation, which is, I'll check my email when I'm ready. And I will alert my manager or team when I need something unblocked. And this is the spirit of asynchronous and iteration, which is do as much work as you can, gather the knowledge that you can from the handbook and the single source of truth. And then when you cannot go any further, you tag the people that can take it forward. And then you go and focus your attention on something else so that you're less concerned with how quickly they get back with you and more concerned that you are in control over what task you're working on in any given time. This is really difficult for new employees to grasp. If they're used to synchronicity, if they're used to just running one project from end to end and not having a few ongoing, it's really difficult to get in the swing of that and be okay with, hey, it might be 12 hours before someone gets back to me on this. But in the meantime, I'm moving this project forward, which I'm helping someone else on. It's just a different way of thinking about it. And when we do all of this out in the open, transparency inherently breeds trust. And we try to just work as openly as possible. So Slack sometimes look really noisy. We see a lot of work that's ongoing, but we allow people to choose what they see. And we would rather have it out there for people to see if they need to, or if they want to, than to withhold it. The, the transparency comes an interesting one, Darren. I, I, you know, the core of it, you know, Google's done a ton of work, or, you know, Project Aristotle and others around this, that, that you know, the core of it, because they found trust was one of the major factors that actually um, was kind of the secret ingredient that made team, teams work and work exceptionally well. And at the core of it, trust is, you know, combination of your character and competence. And so on one side, neither of those things necessarily change because what you want remote, you're still accountable. Are you delivering what you said you're going to deliver? Are you writing wrongs? Are you being accountable for what you said you're going to be? Like all of that stuff still exists. The part that I've learned or I'm learning, I would say, is that transparency part there is, um, 
how to be transparent. And so trying to be, you know, fairly clear, for example, through Slack, I'm, you know, I put myself into a notification that said like, I'm busy for the next hour and a bit. If you, uh, you know, text me right now, I'm not going to get back to you in the middle of doing something, or I've now left for the day. It's now been turned off and similar. Um, and even subtle things, I notice in the business, we have some people who will still keep their calendars private. And so when you go to their calendar to look for time, it shows us private busy blocks. A bunch of us in leadership have said and are trying intentionally to be very public with our calendars. It's a way of creating more transparency. People can see what I'm working on, what I'm doing, what my day looks like. If there's something I need that for some reason is private and just can't be fine, I can make that one private. But even subtle things like that, just to expose yourself more and create a, little, a higher level of transparency in the business, I noticed is um, subtle things that make a big difference, I think, as we go. Um, the one thing I think we are, or at least I'm struggling with a little bit is, and I think we're getting better as we go is, um, you're used to those hallway conversations to create context. And now that's gone. It either requires you to go search for information to learn it and digest it and take the time and for someone to create it. Um, but everything becomes a 30 minute calendar invite and everything becomes a 30 minute calendar meeting for one on ones. And so I'm noticing increasingly now we're getting we're starting to get better at the 10 minute meetings or 15 minute meetings or maybe we can do this through Slack or a shared conversation with a few other people and get it done at once. Um, so I think we're still learning those pieces as we go. That's super interesting. Yeah, like not every meeting has to take 30, 40 minutes out of your day, right? It could, it could be like a quick five minute call through Slack. And that's something a lot of us need to learn or have been learning. Um, so we have a lot of questions from the audience. So I'm, I'm excited to start asking them uh, if you're okay with that. So one of the questions is about uh, the transition to remote work and when teammates don't have the space or equipment necessary to work from home. So what, are, what actions are your companies taking to support these people? Yeah, um, one of the things, actually let me back up on this one. Um, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is you look at the last, you know, 15 years, I suppose, there's been this kind of movement led by technology to make our office environments more comfortable and look more like home. And so we went from these, you know, drab gray cubicle driven to at least in Shopify offices, like beautiful space, comfortable couches. How do you like to work? You like to work you know, in an office by yourself? Do you like to work in a large area? Do you need a table, a couch, a chair? What? And so we tried to replicate effectively home. And now we're in this new world where we're starting to take our home office and, or sorry, you know, which is home and actually trying to figure out how do we professionalize it now to make it um, look more like the office environment that we're um, looking for at the moment. And so um, I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're learning a lot as we go through, but there has been this really interesting transition now of us trying to create good home office space um, that actually feels like office and actually feels like a good work environment. Yeah, at GitLab, we understand that everyone's individual workspace needs are going to be different. You may have ergonomic challenges, mobility challenges. We allow people to spend company money like it's their own and build the workspace that works for them. Uh, this works because we're we hire people that look to this. They have generally worked remotely before. They want to work remotely. They have ambitions of creating a workspace that works for them. So they love the autonomy of being able to do that. Uh, there's also a company called First Base that essentially ships an office in a box. And I think for a lot of enterprises that are being thrust into remote, this may be a great solution where you essentially send every worker a link they can go through the form, say, I've got a great chair, but I need a new monitor. I, I need noise canceling headphones, but I've got a great keyboard. Kind of check what you need. It kind of shows up in a box and you arrange it in a certain way. Uh, that's probably a great solution for, uh, for many companies. But the truth is workspace is huge. Focus is huge. And even if you live in a really small space where you don't have the luxury of a dedicated room, create some sort of, even if it's temporary, an enclave, whether it's a temporary curtain and then a set of noise canceling headphones with an ergonomic laptop stand and an extra monitor, make yourself comfortable. If you hope to be productive and happy for eight hours a day, kind of hunched over a kitchen countertop with a lot of things happening around you, I mean, maybe uh, if you're really good at compartmentalizing, but workspace goes a long way. And um, for leaders that are uh, in control of the purse strings, now is the time to reevaluate those expense policies. Uh, you, if you had people in a skyscraper, they probably had access to five or ten thousand dollars worth of gear, a really amazing ergonomic setup, and now they don't. And so you're going to have to allocate for that and allow for that if you hope that people will continue to be happy and productive where they are. When 
COVID hit and we announced we were going to work from home, one of the things Shopify did immediately, almost without batting an eyelash, was every employee was given $1,000 to spend as they want to outfit their home the way they want. And for some, literally, it was like, I need a super comfortable, lazy boy chair because that's how I like to work. For me, it was I need a stand up desk. That's important to me. It helps my work environment. I didn't have it at home previously. And so Shopify went out of the way to just say like straight out, just here's, we, we're figuring a lot of this stuff out, but for now, $1,000, kick yourself out because it's going to take a while to figure out what this thing's going to look like. I am seeing now increasingly employees that had been office centric historically who didn't live in, lived in a small apartment, et cetera, um, are now starting to make different lifestyle choices. And we're seeing people suddenly say like, I don't know if I want to live in the city. Like I'm living in a tiny apartment because it was close to my office. Maybe now I want to take that same amount of rent and live in a place where I actually have two bedrooms where I can have dedicated office and grass and space and those things. And so I'm noticing people starting to make more significant lifestyle changes. But I think to your point, Darren, for um, businesses that are thinking of this straight out, spend the extra money, trust your people to do what's right to out to create the home environment they need to replicate how they operate or how they work best. Yeah, completely agree with that. I want to touch on one other point that Mark uh, alluded to, which is the second and third order effects of this. So if you were living in San Francisco, for example, because that's where you had to commute to work, and it's in a one bedroom apartment, uh, you have a significant other there, potentially kids at home, obviously not the most ideal place to work remotely from a size standpoint, from a monetary standpoint. But imagine what can happen once the lease runs out. You can then optimize where you live based on completely different factors, based on air quality or schools or space or closeness to family or elders. And you can actually optimize the home or living space that you purchase based on that. Will this place have fiber to the home? Does it have a dedicated space where I can make an office? You start to make very different lifestyle decisions. And this is what's so powerful when you look at Shopify that they've enabled this by default. So that gives their people the power and the autonomy to truly make those decisions and not be concerned about, well, will this get rolled back? You know, if I move five or 10 states away and you know, now I've got to commute back to the office, what does that look like? Don't leave your employees in limbo. This is an amazing opportunity to uh, just send your talent retention through the roof by truly enabling them to decouple the results that they drive from the geography that they're in. That's great. And um, Darren, I know you mentioned the concept of trusting employees. Uh, and we have a couple of questions from the audience about measuring productivity when people work remotely. Uh, someone in the audience said, uh, I'm totally against babysitting employees or micromanagement, but sometimes it's hard, you know, when you're managing a team that's working remotely for the first time. So what is some advice that you can give to managers who are suddenly asked to manage a remote team? Yeah, the advice I, I give to start out is that you have to shift from being a director and handholder to uh, just open to feedback and an unblocker. The role of the manager mostly becomes unblocking and that requires a culture of trust where your directs will come to you and say, this is where I'm at on a project. I can't figure out how to get around this thing. Can you help me get around this thing? Uh, so you are really reliant on your people telling you what they need and then you empowering and equipping them as a leader to run really fast and, and do what they need to do. I think this should have always been the case. This is probably a better approach even in the office, but there's really no other way around it uh, in, a, in a remote setting. Yeah, the, the, I 100% agree with you. And I think that key word you hit on Darren, you, you mentioned trust. I mean, as a leader and a manager, if you're not hiring people that you can trust to work when you're not around, you, you probably have some bigger issues that you need to look at. But assuming you've got people that you trust that they want to do a good job, they want to work hard. And, and actually, I think as Darren and I were talking about earlier, my concern has actually been people when they're not in the office almost have a fear that people are thinking they're not working. And so there's a tendency to actually want to overproduce so that you're seen as like, hey, look what I just did, which is actually very unhealthy. But I think if it's rooted in really strong trust, to Darren's point, the job of a manager is to unblock and actually help people push things through and actually get their projects done. And one of the things we do intentionally internally is we talk a lot about what are the intended outcomes for people. And so we sit down and we regularly review what are our intended outcomes? What do we expect over the course of the month or the quarter or the half year? What should be the outcome that we're looking for? And now I'm going to trust you to go and do it. My job is to maybe test ideas, make sure we're on the right path, but really try to unblock you as I go versus kind of watch your day-to-day -day activities because I'm going to trust you're doing the right things. Yeah, the one th other thing I wanna mention here when it comes to productivity in the time that we're in, be really sensitive to people 
that have lives. Some parents now have kids at home, they're doubling as a homeschool teacher. The expectations should change. I personally have lost an uncle and a grandmother during COVID and we can't have funerals. It, it takes an impact. People are going through things that you have no idea about. And so if you just try to map productivity one-to-one, -one, well, I saw this in the office and now this is happening, don't draw conclusions. Ask a lot of questions filled with empathy because if you just run down the assumption path, it's not, uh, it's not where you want to go. Yeah, I think asking questions is key, especially if you see an employee is, you know, maybe underperforming or just acting differently. There are a lot of assumptions that you might be making as a manager that, you know, you need to clarify by asking questions. And I think that's very wise. Um, another question we have is uh, how to, well, Mark, you mentioned this. A lot of people think that they need to work harder or work longer hours because they're not, like people are not seeing them at the office, right? Uh, someone in the audience called this work guilt. How can you actively uh, encourage employees to manage that work guilt and enjoy a healthy balance? That's a good question. It's, it's a great question. You've touched on a couple things. I think one is as a leader, you have to model it. Which is hard because I, you know, I won't say I'm not immune to it at times. Um, and so I am fairly intentional when I take time off. I'm pretty loud about it. Um, and I think it's good for people to see, well, you know, if he took time off, then it's, it should be okay. Like whatever you model, your people will tend to follow. And so as leaders model the behavior you're looking for and make sure people see it. The second is, is um, to be fairly clear about what, like, you know, I mentioned intended outcomes, for example, what do we expect of our people? And so if our expectation is sitting way up here and they've suddenly had to live at home and become full-time teachers and care for kids and all of these other things, yeah, work gets gonna pile up, they're gonna work too hard, we're gonna end up having people burn out. So you know, try to be very, Darren mentioned the, the com, uh, comment being very empathetic with people, but work with people. What is their situation? Um, what is their current environment? And what is the intended outcome? What do we expect them to try to get done? That is my expectation. I'm not expecting that plus 38%. And in fact, if it's that plus 38%, either we're really bad at figuring out what an intended outcome is, or you were really bad at putting in way too many hours on it. And either of those are a problem we need to look at. And so really clear up front with what the intentions are, um, a lot of empathy, and as leaders, model what you expect. Yep, echo all of that. Um, it's, it's all about articulating the metrics. Remoters guilt is very real. If you're used to essentially giving away hours of your life to your company as a commute, you feel like, well, now do I still have to do that even if I work from home? No, that was never their time to begin with and you should be ruthless about it. It was your time. You are there to deliver results, not to commute. And on the results front, if you meet the result, then take time off. I was just speaking with someone at GitLab that they have a metric of this quarter of hitting 20% on something and they're already above 20%. And they said, well, next week, I'm just going to take some more hours off because I'm at, I'm at the goal. Like, why would I just work longer hours? To Mark's point, if you're that far above the 38%, either you're just not a great manager of your own schedule or we're really bad at setting metrics, um, that should be okay. That should not be taboo to say something like that. And in fact, I hope it's loud and proud so that other people are encouraged to be efficient with their time. It is not a badge of honor to work until you're completely exhausted. And we need to remind each other of that. That's a great point. And I like that you brought up metrics uh, because there's a great question from the audience around the KPI for percentage of public versus uh, DMs in Slack, public messages, the one you mentioned there. And they're very curious. They say it's fascinating. And they're asking if you could share the current percentage at GitLab and where you'd like that number to be. Yeah, so our latest report shows about 19% of all messages are in a fully public channel. And we're hoping to get that to 25% by the next quarter and then on an upward trajectory from there. And we're also doing some analysis on why that is. Why is that? so low and what can we do as a company to encourage more public communication? Is it um, something that we're not uh, eloquent enough about in onboarding? Uh, are people just bringing kind of prior organizational baggage and usage habits uh, and they just feel uncomfortable about it? So we're digging into it and we're gonna to try to stand up some managerial training to improve that. But it all starts by example. We have team leaders that are publicly saying, hey, citing this goal to go from 19 to 25%. Here's something that I'm pulling out of a private channel and I'm, I'm putting in a public channel. 
That's a fascinating metric. I also thought it was very, very interesting. And then the same person has a question about uh, changes and considerations for employees since, the big, since COVID started. So this person is saying, uh, GitLab's handbook for remote has been very helpful for us, uh, but what we're going through right now is not normal, right? It's not a normal switch to remote work. So they're wondering if there are any changes in the GitLab remote policy since COVID started. Yeah, uh, great point. This is not intentionally designed remote work. This is crisis induced work from home, which is very different. I'll give you a great example. We reimburse co working spaces or third spaces. So if someone wants to go work at a WeWork or a Cody or some other place, if their home just isn't amenable to remote, we're totally fine with that. And about a fifth of GitLabbers pre COVID took us up on that. So now we have about a fifth of the company that are working in effectively a suboptimal space because they aren't allowed to do that. So that's very unfortunate. And we're trying to work with those people. If their productivity changes, it's clearly because of their workspace and we're trying to be as sympathetic as possible. The other thing I mentioned the visiting grant briefly where we would partially subsidize travel around the world to visit other employees. Well, because of the travel restrictions, we've had to put that on pause. And the last big thing is our annual retreat where we get everyone together in person. This year it had to be virtual. And it was definitely a letdown. When you have an all remote company, for a lot of people, this is the one week a year that they get to see someone in person and we don't have that. So what we've tried to do on the back of that is start planning for the next one really early on, uh, start drafting some potential locations, some potential dates to get people excited and remind them that this will end. There was a beginning, there will be an end, we're in the middle and the middle isn't always beautiful, but it is where a character is built. I think that's important, reminding people that it's just a moment in time and it will end. Uh, there's another question from Ma for Mark, uh, especially about employee benefits. Uh, has uh, the move to digital by default have any effect on employee benefits at Shopify? Um, so I mentioned that straight up Shopify was very clear of, you know, here's free money to go spend as you see fit to, out, um, to outfit and equip yourself to work from home. Um, there's, it's been interesting. I've talked to some people who've asked questions about and made assumptions of, oh, well, now that you work from home, are they, you know, are we decreasing pay or do you decrease the benefit load or something like that? Because, um, you know, suddenly, you know, we don't have an office to support you and you're living in a low cost center, what have you. Um, and no, the answer is absolutely not. Um, Shopify, um, is very, very focused on its people. I mean, our, we're a people business. We're built on trust. We support young merchants and entrepreneurs around the world who are trying to build businesses and we broker and trust, that's it. And so we've been very clear and leadership's been very clear of, no, our intent is to learn how. We don't know how to do it today, we're learning it. Our intent is to create the world's best um, work from home experience and to figure out what digital default means and how to make it the best experience possible. We think we did a pretty good job of that in the physical world, now we've got to figure out what it looks like in the virtual world or in a, sorry, not virtual world, but a remote world. Um, but the, the quick answer around, you know, we change benefits or, or periods outside of adding to help people figure out what it looks like to work from home in their best environment, the answer is no. That's, that's really good to know. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for sharing such great tips and best practices for people in the audience. And we're going to make sure to compile all this great information for our community as well as a blog post or something like that. But I wanted to ask you before we leave, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, maybe Shopify Plus, GitLab, and just like your experience with remote work in general? You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn at Darren Murph. And if you visit allremote.info, you'll find all of our guides on remote work. And LinkedIn's probably the best to find me. I've got lots of contact information on there. Mark Bergen, Shopify, uh, I'll pop up. That's awesome. So well, thank you very much again to everyone who joined us. We only have a couple of seconds left uh, before the end of the call. So once again, I want to thank Darren and Mark for giving us their time. This was a super interesting conversation and I hope we can do it again soon. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the invite. This was Bye fun. Bye everyone. It was fun. Have a great okay. day.